Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, uh, Mr Speaker. And my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Until this year, the Prime Minister repeatedly promised better wages under this government. Is the reason the Prime Minister had gone silent on that repeated promise because his government has presided over the worst wages growth on record? <laughs> the Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm, I'm happy to respond to the Leader of the Opposition and I'm happy to invite the Treasurer to add further comment. But I simply remind the Leader of the Opposition in the most recent national accounts, real wage growth was up 0.7 per cent through the year. Now, Mr Speaker, they, if they're saying that's the worst on record, then why was it 0.5 per cent through the year when we came to government, Mr Speaker? So real wages growth record. in the most recent quarter, Mr Speaker, is higher in the last quarter than it was in the quarter we inherited from the Labor government, Mr Speaker. So I would ask the Treasurer if he would like to add further the, the response that we have a plan, Mr Speaker, to grow wages and to increase wages, as we've seen in the overall compensation of employees that grew by 5 per cent. And how is that happening, Mr Speaker? Because we're investing in infrastructure, because we're expanding our trade barriers, because we're investing in skills, Mr Speaker. We are ensuring that we're in giving Australians back the money that they earn so they can keep more of what they earn, that we're deregulating key sectors, whether it's in water infrastructure or in agribusiness or other areas essential to the future of the economy. And that the digital economy is becoming a reality under the policies of this government, which increases cash flow for particularly small and medium-sized businesses, and we're taking the regulation monkey off their back. That's how you grow an economy. You don't grow an economy by putting $387 billion worth of higher tax taxes on the hard work of Australians and on the small business community of Australia. The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, when it comes to the Labor Party on the economy, you've always got to look at what, on they left. Say, at what they do, not what they say. Now, Mr Speaker, when the Labor Party was last in office, real minimum wages fell in three the out of the six years. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition. Leader of the Opposition yes, on a point of order. He obviously goes to relevance. The Leader of the Opposition might reflect on the preamble. The Treasurer has the call. <laughs> the inconvenient truths are very difficult for the uh, Leader of the Opposition. When Labor was last in office, real minimum wages fell in three out of the six years. And since we've come to government, they've gone up each and every year, Mr Speaker. Now, when it comes to the wages bill across the economy, economy, it's otherwise known as the compensation of employees, Mr. Speaker. Under us, it's grown by 5% through the year. Under Labor, it was 3.2% through the year. As the Prime Minister referred to, real wages, which the wages price index is a euphemism for, is um, uh, the wages growth above inflation is at 0.7%. This is above the long-run average, Mr Speaker. Now, when it comes to wages, when it comes to money in the pocket of hard-working Australians, there's no better illustration of what we are doing for Australian workers than the tax cuts that passed this parliament against the wishes of those opposite, Mr Speaker. Oh, I'll take that interjection. We voted for them, he said, The Mr. Treasurer's Speaker. time has concluded. The member for Wide Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister inform the House how a strong budget guarantees the essential services Australians rely on, especially in times of need, including residents of my electorate who have been affected by bushfires? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question, and I thank him for the strong leadership he's shown in his community, as so many members are as uh, their communities are being confronted uh, by terrible fires in, in recent weeks. Uh, I was with the member for Wright in his electorate on Friday with Jenny and uh, the opportunity to thank those volunteers for the tremendous work they're doing, whether they're working in the canteen or they're working on the front line of the fire, they are doing an extraordinary job. And I know the, uh, the anxiety that they're going through at this point, and that's why it's incredibly important that the government move swiftly, acting with the state governments in both New South Wales and in Queensland in particular for the member's home state uh, to ensure that the disaster uh, relief funding was put in place and those payments are available through the state government. But we also, as of today, have activated uh, the disaster recovery allowance 
and that's offering assistance uh, for those affected by fires whose income have been affected by fires for 13 weeks. And that's available in Armidale and Belgian and Clarence Valley and Glen Ennis, Inverell, Tenerfield, Urala, Walker, in New South Wales and in Noosa, Scenic Rim, uh, Southern Downs and the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Now, Mr. Speaker, there's been much talk about the government budget coming back into surplus this year, and the final budget outcome will come out soon in terms of the, the finish of the most recent financial year. It's important to rebuild the nation's finances, exactly right. to bring the budget back into surplus, exactly. to ensure that we can pay down debt, and indeed in the most recent budget figures, Mr Speaker, the debt will fall uh, by some $50 billion over the forward estimates, and interest payments will fall from $8.7 billion in 2018-19 uh, down, down to $8.7 billion over the forward estimates. Mr. Speaker. Now, it's important you do that. Because I remember when the floods hit Brisbane, what the Labor Party had to do, because they are at that time facing a more than $40 billion deficit, is they had to go and tax the Australian people with a flood levy because they weren't able to manage the finances of the Australian government, Mr. Speaker. So it's very important. Now, those, opp those opposite mount interjections. And they have been the ones who have been saying that the budget surplus should be eroded. We don't believe so because, Mr Speaker, we believe we need to stay in a strong financial position and to achieve a budget surplus, which those opposite do not believe we should do, so we can respond to natural Member disasters, Man. so we can respond to the needs of farmers who are, and rural communities who are facing the drought. The Prime Mr. Minister Speaker. will resume his seat. The Leader of the opposition. Yeah, my order. point of order is on decency, Prime yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker. We the, should not politicise the of the natural disasters. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr. Speaker, I, I take the member's interjection. That is not what the government is doing. Oh. Mr. Speaker, on my left. I am pointing out very clearly that in order to be able members to on respond, my left. you must be able to ensure the government. Maintains a strong financial position. The Mr. Prime Speaker, Minister's time that's has what concluded. we must do. Members on both sides, the member for Griffith. <laughs> the member for Petrie is not seeking a question, I hope. It's the, the shadow treasurer just reflected on the Prime Minister and he should withdraw. It's that simple. Well, as is often the case when members are interjecting wildly, I find it bizarre that I'm expected to hear everything that's going on. But if the shadow treasurer did uh, use an unparliamentary comment, he needs to withdraw it. I leave it up to him. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I withdraw. I thank the member for Rankin. My the question... member for Rankin has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why, in this House, does the Prime Minister ignore the seven public statements? by the Reserve Bank Governor since the election about the need for economic stimulus and pretend that they were never made. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for the question, and I was just going to that exact point about the government's fiscal policy in my response to the previous member's question. We believe it's important to maintain and achieve a surplus. Now we know that because this side of the House delivers surpluses. Correct. That side of the House haven't seen a surplus since 1989, Mr Speaker. But I'm asked specifically the about the Rankin. comments of the Reserve Bank Governor. And I have to once again remind the House of the testimony given by the Governor of the Reserve Bank in evidence to the House of Representatives Standing Committee, where he said, and I quote, if the, government is, if the economy is not doing well and the global economy is not doing well, we need all arms of public policy to support the Australian economy. But that is not a call for the government to do more now. I just want to be clear about that. That is the statement, Mr Isaacs. Speaker, on the 9th of August by the Governor of the Reserve Bank to the House of Representatives Standing Committee on the Economy. Now, if the Labor Party can't understand the plain English that is put towards a, a committee of this House where the Reserve Bank Governor has been crystal clear about what his view is, and they want to use and verbal the Reserve Bank Governor to try and encourage the government 
to abandon fiscal discipline, to abandon surpluses as they did when they were last in government. See, this is the difference. This is the difference, Mr. Speaker. Our government understands the need to continue to show measure and discipline and certainty and stability when it comes to the managing of the government's finances. Those opposite were unable to do that. They saddled this country up for a debt that will be paying back for the next decade, Mr. Speaker. That's what they saddled us up to. And when we come to this dispatch box and we say, when you can't manage money, you can't run the country, Mr. Speaker, that's what happened when they couldn't pay for pharmaceuticals and they had to tax the Australian people to respond to disasters. Just before I call the member for Nichols, the member for Griffiths is now warned, as is the member for Lyons. The member for Nichols has the call. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Minister inform the House how the morrison mccormack government is providing stability and certainty to regional Australia that are suffering through the drought, including through the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Nichols for his uh, very timely question, Mr Speaker. And as we know, uh, much of Australia is experiencing a, a terrible drought. Uh, and as a government, we've already committed more than $7 billion to uh, helping our farmers and our regional communities uh, through this prolonged dry spell. And we can and we must and we will do more. Uh, many of us in this place actually live in these drought stricken areas, Mr. Speaker, and we see how the communities, we see them firsthand, how they're suffering, Mr. Speaker. It is, it is heartbreaking. We'll continue to provide the necessary support to them. And to help build a resilience in our drought affected communities, uh, this government has committed $1.3 billion uh, to our National Water Infrastructure Development Fund. Uh, it's an important investment. The member for Nichols and his community know just how important it is. They know just how important water infrastructure, indeed water security, is. Uh, the Midiamo pipeline project runs through uh, the member for Nichols and the member for Mallee's electorates. And it is a $14.5 million commitment to water security in the Midiamo region. It's going to provide a reliable water source to provide for agricultural industries. But much more than that, Mr Speaker. And, uh, and I remember being there uh, with the members on that, uh, on that windswept day at that football oval, and the locals were so impressed, so happy and so relieved that we were getting on and doing it. Years of talk uh, has turned into action. And, uh, and I commend the member for Nichols, I commend the, uh, the member for Mallee for their hard work in this regard. The project will cover up to 75,000 hectares and uh, 180 farms. It will be, will be supported through 375 kilometres of pressurised pipeline, uh, providing 85 megalitres of future proofing storage. Now, previously, uh, these farms were reliant on farm dams, which we know, Mr Speaker, are drying up. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, uh, don't take my word for it. The project, the project committee chairman, Neil Allen, had this to say. It means we will have clean, fresh water 24 hours a day. We will no longer have to rely on channel-filled dams. Water will be cleaner for stock, cleaner for boom sprays, and, as it's a sparsely populated area, it's an ideal spot for pigs and poultry. This is also an opportunity for feedlots to finish lambs off, and they won't have to worry about water. Mr. Speaker, that's significant. The Midiamo pipeline is one of 21 projects, indeed, being delivered so far through the uh, National Water Infrastructure Development Fund, and we're working with state and territory governments to do even more. Mr. Speaker, uh, it's plain and simple. We need to build dams, and indeed, we are doing that. There's been many water storage infrastructure projects we've already ticked off on that will be finished uh, already this year, Mr Speaker, and the National Water Grid Authority is going to take the petty politics out of it. We're going to get on and build more water storage infrastructure because if there's one thing our farmers and our rural communities know, water security is vital for their future and for their prosperity. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Will the government adopt a key recommendation released today by the ACCC that the National Energy Guarantee be implemented to achieve, and I quote from them, the objective of reducing carbon emissions at low cost while promoting investment in a manner that ensures demand for energy is met? The Minister for Energy. Order Frankenstein policy. The Minister for Energy has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. And of course, he will recall 
the, the NEG had two parts. The first part was a retailer reliability obligation, and the ACCC tells us today uh, on page 114 that the Australian government has implemented the reliability component of the National Energy Guarantee. We've implemented it, Mr Speaker. The second part, of course, of the National Energy Guarantee was the 26 per cent emission reduction target, Mr Speaker, and we will reach that in the national electricity market, which is what it was focused on, eight to nine years ahead of schedule, Mr Speaker, by 2021 or 2022, Mr Speaker. Uh, now, the reason for that is very simple. We are seeing record levels of investment in solar and wind in our national electricity market right now, Mr Speaker. Three times, three times the level per capita, the average across uh, the UK, France and Germany. These are record levels of investment, and the result of it is we will reach our emissions target years ahead of time. But, Mr Speaker, more broadly across the economy, we are also on target to reach our emissions obligations. Our 2020 obligations, our, our Kyoto 2020 the obligations, Minister, Mr Speaker. We will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a Mr. point Speaker, of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. It was a very specific question. It's about the national energy guarantee. It's not about Kyoto. It's not about anything else. It's the ACCC recommendation about what was their the policy. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Whoever, whoever on the government side is trying to sort of give me instructions or bark orders at me, can I tell you that's counterproductive? You're trying to bone Fletcher. Seriously. <laughs> Well, Fletcher's not going red. <laughs> Further members by their correct titles. Let me come to the um, come to the point of order. I just say to the leader of the opposition, I am I am listening very closely. Certainly, the question was specific, but the minister did address uh, up front uh, part of the recommendations uh, and part of the release that was done today. As I listen to him, he's outlining the government's approach uh, to reducing emissions. That's what he's outlining, which is still on the policy topic of the question. So the minister has the call. Well, uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, uh, we have laid out to the last ton how we will reach our 2030 obligations. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, th those opposite gave us a 700 million tonne deficit in emissions reduction when we came into government. We've turned that round, a 1.1 billion tonne turnaround. But what we're not going to do, Mr Speaker, is we're not going to trash the economy like the policies those opposite took to the last election. The member for Kennedy. Energy, energy. No, just, just before the member for Kennedy goes on, the member for McKellar looks confused. Uh, this is... I don't need any interjections. If he jumps after the member for Kennedy's questions concluded, he'll find that uh, he'll get the call. The member for Kennedy has the call. Uh, Energy Minister, are you aware of the crisis in North Queensland with untenable electricity charges jeopardising 4,000 million a year of national income? Further, would you, as grandson of Sir William Hudson, builder of the Snowy, Help us and accept an invitation to visit our triangle of power, as has the Deputy PM, and as has Barnaby Joyce and Anthony Albanese. Hells Gates, Townsville, Hewenden's Wind Hydro, the Tully Hydro realignment, a triangle that will generate 5 per cent of Australia's electricity, clean, cheap, renewable and forever, all dependent upon the construction of copper string transmission line. <coughs> The Minister for Energy. I have not mentioned it again. Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would be delighted to come along at a time that suits. And, and I, I appreciate your acknowledgement of my grandfather in your, your question. Now, the Australian government is committed to improving energy security, reliability, and affordability, including in North Queensland uh, and the region that includes your electorate. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this year. Uh, I announced earlier in the year a $4.7 million grant to assist with the cost of feasibility work for the copper string project that you talked about, a pro proposed transmission line between Mount Isa and Hewenden, of course. 
It aims to allow major users of electricity in Mount Isa and along the corridor access to uh, the, the electricity from the national electricity market. And that, in turn, should encourage investment in processing mines and other projects across the corridor and into Mount Isa as, as well. The, the grant covers the cost of preparatory work, EISs uh, and native title agreements, amongst other things. Now, I understand that Copper String is also talking to the CFC about future financing. Of course, this is part of our broader commitment to central and north Queensland, a commitment that many on this side of the place share. And I know the member for Leichhardt is passionate about the Daintree microgrid project, another energy project from north Queensland, which is important for affordability and reliability in that region, along with the Kidston Pump Hydro project, $610 million project uh, up in the north as well. But, Mr Speaker, our heavy lifting in Queensland will only work if the Palaszczuk government wants to put downward pressure on prices. To give access to the na national electricity market helps if those prices are affordable for the businesses in Mount Isa and along the corridor, Mr Speaker. And we know just last year they ripped $1.65 billion of cash out of their electricity network to try to make ends meet in their budget, Mr. Speaker, in their budget. We are absolutely committed to a fair deal on energy for Central and North Queensland. Yeah. Yeah. Member for McKellar. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Can the Treasurer update the House on how the Morrison government's certain and stable fiscal management is, will keep our economy resilient in the, in the face of future challenges? Is the tre Treasurer aware of any threats to our economy? The Treasurer has a call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for McKellar for his question. And with a, business a small business background, and he chairs the House Tax and Revenue Committee, and he's absolutely committed to uh, strong fiscal management, Mr Speaker. Now, when we came to government, business, develop business investment was in free fall. Debt was rising, and we saw unemployment at 5.7 per cent and rising. Mr. Speaker. Since we've come to government, we've actually turned that around. Unemployment has fallen to 5.2 per cent, and we've helped create more than 1.4 million new jobs. Mr. Speaker. The proportion of working age Australians who are on welfare is now the lowest in 30 years, and the rate of real growth in government spending is now the lowest of any government in 50 years, Mr Speaker, and the budget is coming back to surplus for the first time in more than a decade. And the reason why fiscal management is important and bringing the budget back to surplus is important is because future generations should not have to pick up the tab for the last. We need to live within our means. Also, responsible fiscal management helps build resilience in the economy to deal with future shocks as well as responsible fiscal management ensures that we can provide the services that Australians need and deserve. But, Mr Speaker, I'm asked, are there any alternative approaches? And we know that those opposite are continually talking down the Australian economy. Could you imagine now, with the challenges we face, with flood, drought and fire and the global trade tensions, what the economy would look like with Labor whacking it with $387 billion of higher taxes, Mr. Speaker. They're happy to talk down the economy, but they took to the Australian people $387 billion of higher taxes, Mr. Speaker. Now, they, now the member for Rankin gets up and he says he's committed to surplus, but he's also talking about bringing forward tax cuts that he opposed, Mr. Speaker. He's also, he, I take that interjection, we voted for them. He called our tax cuts offensive, Mr. Speaker. The member for McMahon says they were reckless, Mr. Speaker. I mean, the Labor Party are happy to talk down the Australian economy, to tell, our, tell us our tax cuts were offensive, but then when they pass the parliament, they want the credit, Mr. Speaker. I mean, get real, member for Rankin. We know you want to tax a lot, but I'm thinking back, thinking of taking back that night that I gave you earlier, Mr Speaker. Now, the reality is the Labor Party can't manage money. The Labor Party can't manage money, and the Australian people know when you can't manage money, the Labor Party come after theirs. 
The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the Prime Minister's tabling of a written statement by the member for Chisholm during question time last week. During that answer, was he aware that by tabling the statement, instead of having the member for Chisholm speak directly to the House, the House would be prevented from holding the member for Chisholm to account for any inaccuracies in the statement? Why did he take that action rather than let the member for Chisholm stand in Parliament and make a statement in her own words? The Leader of the House on a point of order. For, for a start, Mr Speaker, it contains imputations about inaccuracies without identifying any. And secondly, uh, the standing orders are not inside the ministerial responsibilities of the Prime Minister. I'm just going to hear from the Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, he got himself into it. Thanks, Speaker. Both in the preamble and quite specifically in the question at the end, I have asked about an answer that the Prime Minister gave in the House and why he gave it in a particular way. The point that the manager of opposition business makes, I think, is right. He, the question is about an action the Prime Minister took during question time in answer to a question last week. So, for me to prevent questioning of something the Prime Minister had said in an answer, uh, I don't think would be right. So, I'm going to call the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I tabled the document because I undertook to do so outside of this place at a press conference, and I always follow through on my word. The member for Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Will the minister outline to the House how the Morrison government is delivering lower electricity prices by holding energy companies to account to their customers, and is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for his question. And he is, like the rest of us on this side of the house, focused on driving down power prices because he knows that a dollar off an Australian's power bill is a dollar in their back pocket, Mr. Speaker. A dollar in the back pocket of hard-working Australians, Mr. Speaker, and that's why. We've taken strong action to lower power prices. From the 1st of July, we've seen the default market offer come into place, a price cap on standing offers, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and we were delighted to see that the ACCC today welcomed the implementation of that all-important reform. The report from the ACCC shows that since the 1st of July and the introduction of the price cap, almost 800,000 Australian households and businesses have benefited from that reduction in standing offers across New South Wales, South Australia, South East Queensland. And Mr Speaker, uh, their savings have been significant, typically $190 and as much as five or $600 from the highest standing offers that existed before the reforms, and much more for small businesses. Mr. Speaker. And we know that the people who, uh, who were on the, West de the worst deals are saving the most. The report also tells us that we've seen a significant reduction in the sneaky late payment fees uh, that were in place, sadly, from many of the energy companies in the past. It tells us the competition is alive and well, Mr. Speaker, uh, and so it still pays to shop around. And some of the best available offers, market offers, come from the second-tier retailers, Mr. Speaker. There's still more to do. And we're committed to doing it to see, uh, make sure that positive things are happening. The reductions in energy prices that we've seen tabled in this report continue on. Now, Mr. Speaker, by contrast, we have those opposite who took to the election a plan to drive up power prices that independent modelling told us would double wholesale power prices. Mr. Speaker, double wholesale power prices. Now, Mr. Speaker. Right now, though, they don't know what they're for and against, Mr. Speaker. They don't know what they're for and against. Are they for John Setka or are they against John Setka? The, are they the minister? No, I haven't said anything yet. I was just. <laughs> the minister need. The minister needs needs to remain directly relevant to the question 
he was asked. He can compare and contrast on the policy topic he was asked, but he can't free range into other policy areas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll, unless, I'll stick unless, with... he, unless he can convince me the person he mentioned is somehow related to energy policy. I'll, I'll stick with energy and emissions reduction, Mr. Speaker. Are they that, for that's a 45 per cent emission reduction target or are they against it? The member for Maribyrnong tells us he's proud of it. He's proud of it, Mr. Speaker. Are they for coal or are they against it? What's the member for Hunter's view on coal, Mr. Speaker? Are they for the energy big stick or are they against it, Mr. Speaker? Are they against it? Only the Liberal National Government can be trusted to bring down power prices. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Why did the Prime Minister deny using the phrase Shanghai Sam, something he did at least 17 times, including in this House? Prime Minister has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, I understand that the Leader of the Opposition is a busy member of Parliament, and he may not have had the opportunity to hear the interview I did uh, later that afternoon. When I returned from visiting left. the bushfires uh, with the member for right, there was a question that was put at the end of a press conference where I was standing next to the recovery centre. And Mr. Speaker, I heard the word racism used twice in that question, and that's what I was referring to. So, Mr. Speaker, if the best that the Leader of the Opposition can drum up is that withering attack, Mr. Speaker, then I'm sure there's a lot of optimistic people who sit on the backbench of the Labor Party who can see a big opportunity for themselves. Members on both sides, the mem members on both sides, the member for Bowman has the call. Speaker, a question to the Minister for Industry science and technology. Will the minister outline to the House the importance of greater competition to bring down energy prices, um, particularly for Australian industry and manufacturing? Uh, minister, are you aware of any threats to energy security in Australia? The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the yeah, member for his question. And I share his concerns about energy prices and energy reliability and their impact on businesses, not just in Queensland, but right across Australia. Mr Speaker, let me start with, I guess, an important stat that starts to put this into a little bit of perspective for manufacturing industries, and that is that manufacturing represents about 20 per cent of total final energy consumption in Australia, close to 20 per cent. So any increases, any changes in energy prices, in energy reliability has an enormous impact on Australian businesses and especially on Australian manufacturing businesses. When now you put this into the perspective that there are about 900,000 jobs in manufacturing in Australia. You can see that changes to energy uh, supply and reliability has a huge impact. Now, on this side of the House, we are absolutely committed to doing everything that we can to make sure that energy is reliable and that prices are as low as they possibly can be. That's what we are committed to on this side of the House. We want Australians to keep their jobs in manufacturing, and we want Member Australian manufacturing to be strong so that we are creating the jobs of the future for our young Member people. For Shortland. Um, now, I was asked, Mr Speaker, if there were any threats to energy security, and clearly there are some threats to energy security. There are those opposite and their allegiance with the Greens and, importantly, with Getta. So that alliance, that alliance combines to promote and present something that is ideologically opposed is to lower energy prices. And we have seen the impact of ideologically driven policy on energy prices and security of supply, particularly in South Australia. And when there's a supply issue, it's the manufacturing businesses that are impacted, often first, and their operations are shut down, often for a shift at a time. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to finish today by noting that the former leader, on my left. you know, they are so smug over there, and they just forget. They forget that on their watch, 
Now, on bear watch, one in eight manufacturing jobs was lost. Shame on you. Shame on you. And what a good thing you did win the last election because the light would have gone out on Australian manufacturing and we can't afford a Labor government in this country. Members on both sides. The member for McEwen and the member for Gorton. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And my question is again to the Prime Minister, and I refer to his previous answer. In his statement to the media, the Prime Minister said he hadn't used, and I quote, either of those phrases. If one of the phrases he thought he'd been asked about was an accusation that something was racist, what was the other phrase if it wasn't Shanghai Sam? <laughs> the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Members Speaker. on both sides. Mr. Speaker. Members on both sides. I refer member, again. For Goldstein, member for Goldstein's preventing the Prime Minister answering the question. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I refer the member to my earlier answer. The phrase racist was used twice in the question. That's what I heard. That's what I was referring to when I said I was I had used neither of those phrases, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the opposition honestly thinks that this, this is the best he can do. Last week, the Leader of the Opposition lamely Member came for up here and, and did for something, Sydney's Mr warned. Speaker, which Leader of the Oppositions rarely do unless they really think they have locked it up when they called on a me, me to have one of my members resign, Mr Speaker. Now, you don't do that lightly. And he did that in this place on one day, and the next day he didn't even mention it. Mr Speaker, that is the weakness and lameness of this Leader of the Opposition. So what is he doing all day? Pouring over transcripts, worrying about this word and that word. Mr Speaker, this country is in drought. This country is facing natural disasters. This country is facing severe economic challenges. And the Leader of the Opposition is, is running around like a researcher looking up grabs. Grow up! The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction. Will the Minister update the House on the Morrison government's approach to setting and meeting our consistent and responsible emissions reduction targets? And will the Minister advise how imposing reckless emission targets would impact households and small business, including in my electorate of Robertson? The Minister for Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for Robertson for her question. And she is in favour of strong policies on this side of the house that will reduce emissions and, at the same time, keep a strong economy. Mr. Speaker, keep a strong economy. Now, just as when we came into office in 2013, we were faced with a severe fiscal deficit. We were faced with a severe emissions reduction de deficit of over 700 million tonnes. Mr. Speaker, and today, as of December last year, we've turned that round to a surplus of 367 million tonnes. That means we have improved our emissions reduction position by 1.1 billion tonnes in our time in government. Mr. Speaker, now uh, we've outlined down to the last ton how we're going to achieve our 2030 obligations, Mr. Speaker, and the centrepiece of that is a three and a half billion dollar climate solutions package, Mr Speaker. Indeed, it's a policy that is backed by the WA State Labor government. I quote here, Mr Speaker, the State Labor Energy Minister, we respect the fact that the current government won the election and has a mandate to follow its policies through, Mr Speaker, but there is a risk, and I'm looking at it, Mr Speaker. Those opposite have no idea what they're for or against. We've got the leader of the uh, the Leader of the Opposition crab-walking away from the member for Maribyrnong's targets, who is still proud of them, Mr Speaker. He's proud of them, but he and the member for Sydney, they're not letting go easily, Mr Speaker. They're not letting go easily. We have the member for Hindmarsh saying every Labor policy should be on the table, including climate policy, saying their policy review should be ruthless and unsparing, Mr Speaker. Well, I agree with that. Well, I agree with that. And we have the member for Griffith 
talking, uh, talking about a CPRS in glowing terms in the Federation Chamber, Mr. Speaker. In the Federation Chamber, and then we have the member for Hunter. And I want to quote this right. The member for Hunter saying, of course, we have to speak about the carbon tax again. And they've brought in the architect of the carbon tax, that luminary for red combe, to review their climate policies, Mr Speaker, to review their climate policies. Labor has thrown its whole platform up in the air for review, but one old classic is back with a vengeance, the carbon tax. The Leader of the Opposition. My question is again to the Prime Minister, and I again refer to his previous answers. Is the reason the Prime Minister used the phrase Shanghai Sam at least 17 times the same reason he supported weakened protections against racist hate speech and university level English tests for new citizens? The Prime Mr. Minister has to call. The uh, Leader of the Opposition once said at the National Press Club, he said this. Members on my left. Said, I'm re I'm reminded of it, Mr Speaker. Members on my left. Talking about serious people for Prime serious Minister. times, Mr Speaker. I'm not going to Prime table Minister it because he gets enough publicity carrying on with this nonsense every single day, Mr Speaker. Mm. But, Mr Speaker, I'm asked about this government's views effectively on the integrity of our immigration system and the rules that we imply, the rules we impose to ensure the surety of that system and to ensure cohesion in Australian society. Now, Mr Speaker, our government makes no apology for our policies when it comes to the integrity of our immigration system. We make no apologies for the work that we've done on border protection that have kept our borders secure and ensures that all Australians can have confidence in an immigration system which has made this country the most effective and the most successful immigration nation on earth. Mr Speaker, multicultural Australia. The manager of opposition business is raising a point of order. Yeah. The three issues that the question refers to, Mr Speaker, go to the phrase Shanghai Sam, go to the laws against racist hate speech and go to citizenship tests. And the Prime Minister is speaking about none of the three. Well, the Prime Minister was just mentioning multiculturalism, so I thought after, after his preamble he was coming to some of the points that are in the question. So the Prime Minister, I'll, I'll listen to the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I was about to speak about the importance of multiculturalism in Australia. And Australia has the most successful multicultural record of any nation in the world today. And the Member policies that we've pursued as a government have only made that stronger. Member for McMahon we've made, those, we've made them stronger, Mr Speaker, the and Prime we'll continue Minister, to make them stronger. Prime Minister, pause. Member for McMahon will leave understanding order 94A. Prime Minister has the call. But thank you, Mr. Speaker. But on the first matter which the member raised, the reason we have foreign interference laws in Australia is because of the former Senator Dastyari, Mr. Speaker, and the Labor Party should well know that. Their record on this issue is an absolute shambles, and they can try and distract and uh, attention from their own rows, where it's because of the New South Wales ALP branch of the Labor Party and their plastic bags and cash, or the disastrous role of the former Senator Astiari, Mr Speaker, and the fact that he had to resign because of his own actions. They can run from these issues, Mr Speaker, but they can never hide, Mr Speaker, and nor, nor can they hide from what the Labor leader in New South Wales said before the last state election, that Asians would take their jobs, that Asians would take Australian jobs, Mr Speaker. That's the true out of the Labor Party. That's, in fact, why they were started, Mr Speaker. The member for Stirling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations. Will the Minister update the House on how the Morrison government is taking action to deliver certainty and stability for small businesses, for workers, and for subcontractors by ensuring that registered organisations and their officials obey the law? And is the Minister aware? of any alternative approaches. 
The Attorney General and Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. And as the member is aware, the Ensuring Integrity Bill before this place simply sets out appropriate standards for someone to hold the important position as an official of a registered organisation. Uh, the bill would allow a court to determine at its discretion whether it's appropriate uh, for someone to maintain office as a public official in, say, for instance, a union where they'd committed an offence against the law of the Commonwealth or a state that carry a term of imprisonment of two years or more. Why is that necessary, Mr Speaker? Well, there are multiple examples of individuals holding these important public offices who have offended against that rule. And there was one reported, which will be of great interest to all members assembled in the Australian Financial Re Review today, two CFMEU organisers, one Mr Nicholas Riquez and one, one Mr Simon Gutierrez. Mr Riquez, Mr. Riquez pleaded guilty to supplying an indictable quantity of a prohibited drug, an offence an offence that carries a penalty of more than two years imprisonment. Mr Gutierrez pleaded guilty to possession of a prohibited drug. The supply charge for these offences related to an earlier conviction of Mr Michael Greenfield, another CFMEU official, for possessing a prohibited drug. All three are still employed at the CFMEU. And interestingly, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Gutierrez, it's reported, was previously convicted to 18 months, serving a non-parole period of seven months in prison for supplying a prohibited drug in a commercial quantity on an ongoing basis. Now, I have managed to get the transcript of a. Uh, I think that members you'll be very left. interested in it, members opposite. I think you'll be very interested in it. This is the application. This is the application for Mr. Gutierrez when he was applying for an entry permit to building sites. This is after the first conviction, before the second conviction. And the submission that was put as to why this person should have an entry permit as a union official was this. And I've heard a lot in the years over the courts. I've never heard this before. The submission as to why, after the first conviction and before the second, he should have a public official's entry permit was this. Quote, working for the CFMEU had given him the opportunity to change his life for the better. <laughs> now, it would seem, Mr Speaker, the only problem with the CFMEU's drug rehabilitation program is the spate of later drug convictions after someone's been in the CFMEU drug rehabilitation program. And just the other day, and the silence is now deafening, we had John Setka, who's obviously in charge of their anger management programs. And what did John Setka say? He said about crossbenchers who might vote in favour of a bill that says you shouldn't have a drug conviction and be a public official. He said, we're going to make it so that in 20 years' time, when they're walking down the street, we'll put the finger to them. The they're aware of the damage concluded. we can do. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving the following motion immediately. That the House 1 notes a the Prime Minister has refused to sack the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, despite the Minister admitting on radio he was acting for private interests instead of the public interests, and despite the Minister's clear and repeated breaches of the Prime Ministerial standards. B. The Prime Minister has prevented the member for Chisholm from providing a full statement in her own words to this House, where words carry consequences and instead relied on a statement prepared by the PMO issued outside the House. C. On Friday, the Prime Minister denied using the phrase Shanghai Sam, despite using it at least 17 times, including twice in the House. And D. The Prime Minister's attempt to cover up his untruth on Friday with another untruth is just the latest in a long line of misdirection and obfuscation from this Prime Minister, and two, therefore condemns this Prime Minister for repeatedly abandoning any sense of integrity whenever it is politically expedient for him to do so. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has been exposed for his hubris. He's been exposed for his opportunism and he's been exposed for his hypocrisy. Legitimate questions have been raised about the member for Chisholm. The who Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the House has the call. Uh, I move that the member no longer be heard.
Leader of the House has moved, the Leader of the Opposition be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. Order the question is the Leader of the House be no further heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Gray and Nichols, tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Werriwa and Lawler, tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 73, no 64. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition seconded? The Manager of Opposition Business? Seconded. When he opens his mouth, it's opposite day. Opposite the, every single time. The, the Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. The Leader of the House has the call. I move that the member be no longer heard. The question is that the Manager of Opposition Business be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. If the ayes have it, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seats unless they are leaving the chamber or did not vote in the previous division or they are changing their vote, in which case they must report to the tellers. Lock the doors. The question is the manager of opposition business be no further heard. Members must remain in their seats unless they are changing their votes or did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers. The result of the division is ayes 72, noes 64. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. The Leader of the House. I move that the question be put. The Leader of the House has moved the question be put. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Again, I point the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seats unless they're, cha unless they're leaving the chamber uh, or they did not vote in the previous division or they're changing their vote, in which case they must report to the tellers. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be put. Members must remain in their seats unless they are changing their vote or did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order the result of the division is ayes 72, no 64. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. 
The question now is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. 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 I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes because at least one member has left the chamber. <laughs> Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Lawler and Werriwa tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Nichols and Gray tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is I 62, no 73. The question is therefore negative. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice plan. Thank you, the Prime